right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I'm gonna give it a few moments for people to get logged in here and we will get started shortly. So as you are logging in, um, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, this meeting is being recorded. We will be posting it on our California Progressive Alliance YouTube page. Um, we can post links for that or you can just Google it on YouTube. Um, but thank you all again for joining us. I'm really looking forward to this discussion with our, our main speakers, David Cobb and Emily Kuwano, and I'll be introducing them further in just a moment. Just so everyone's aware, this event is about a solidarity economy, which we will be explaining, and it is being co-presented by California Progressive Alliance, the Cooperation Humboldt, and the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network. Um, if those of you that are not familiar, California Progressive Alliance is a statewide independent volunteer network of progressive individuals, groups, and organizations united by our shared belief that a better California is possible by reclaiming our government from the corporate interests that have overshadowed the voices of the people. Together, regardless of party affiliation or no party affiliation, California Progressive Alliance seeks to elevate progressive ideas throughout the state, promote the creation of local political alliances and people-powered coalitions to enact progressive change in local government. Support, we also look to support corporate free progressive candidates and progressive issues based, uh, progressive issue based electoral campaigns and wield our collective power to lobby the state on current and future legislation as well as research and write new model legislation. So check out more of California Progressive Alliance at our website and please join us and uh, we hope to see you. Uh, also Cooperation Humboldt. Cooperation Humboldt helps to build a solidarity economy which we'll be discussing further today. Um, they're up in California's North Coast. Um, they support existing cooperative efforts and create new solutions where needed. And lastly, quickly about the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network. The mission of the U.S. CEN is to connect a diverse array of individuals, organizations, businesses, and projects in a shared work of building and strengthening regional, national, and international movements for a solidarity economy. Through publications, <clears throat> a website, mailing lists, and face-to-face -face gatherings, the network will facilitate ongoing communications and dialogue related to the development of a solidarity economy, uh, ideas, values, and practices the sharing of experiences, models, and skills, and the creation of collaborative movement building projects between network members. I'm so thankful for everyone being here, and I'm so thankful for all of these organizations and all the hard work that they're doing. Um, my name is Nick Cortez, and I am chair of the California Progressive Alliance. Um, before I introduce our other speakers, I'll just um, briefly, well, here, let me go ahead and introduce who you will be seeing. So we have um, Emily Kawano. Emily is the co-director of the Wellspring Cooperative um, Corporation, which is building a network of working worker-owned cooperatives in the understand, <coughs> underserved communities of Springfield, Maryland. Um, worker cooperatives provide wealthy wealth building opportunities for worker owners, as well as control over their work. Building democracy in the workplace is a key piece of building a solidarity economy. Emily is also founder and co-coordinator of the United States Solidarity Economy Network and serves on the board of RIPIS and um, <clears throat> has been on there for almost a decade now. And David Cobb is a people's lawyer who has sued corporate polluters lobbied elected officials, and run for political office himself. He's been arrested for nonviolent civil disobedience. He believes we must provoke 
and win a peaceful revolution for a peaceful, just, sustainable, and cooperative society if we are to survive. So thank you again for being with us. And the reason we are here this afternoon is to discuss the solidarity economy, which David is going to kick us off with here. Um, David, I'll go ahead and pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, and I want to extend a personal note of gratitude to Nick Cortez as an individual, uh, but also to the California Progressive Alliance as an organization. Uh, there are many efforts to find uh, electoral political uh, expressions today. And the reason that I throw down and am an avid uh, supporter of the California Progressive Alliance is because of the corporate free requirement before CPA rolls with somebody seeking our support. And notice I say our, because I am individually active with the North Coast People's Alliance, which is in process to become a formal affiliate organization. And just to name it, uh, Emily and I are co-coordinators of the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network. At our next board meeting, uh, we are going to be proposing that the USN become an ally organization of the California Progressive Alliance, because we are dedicated to building that movement of movements. Um, before we even get into the solidarity economy, I want to disabuse folks of a notion that I once held, which is economics are for you know, really folks who can understand graphs and charts, and it's a, it's a very complex subject, and I really, I'm not inspired by it, and I really can't understand it. Uh, Emily Coano and other practical economists have helped me to see differently, because the word economy actually comes from the Greek language, and it literally means the management of the household or the management of our home. So literally, if you balance a checkbook, uh, if you are paying rent and buying food, if you are making your household run, congratulations, you are an economist. What Emily, are gonna do, uh, Emily and I are going to do is our best to ex describe how the current national political economy operates uh, and why it's so destructive and how we can transition it, not just the, 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 the vision, we definitely have a vision, but literally concrete steps to transition uh, in some very practical ways. So first, what is a solidarity economy? Uh, hopefully Nick has up on the screen the, uh, the slide, uh, but it's important to understand that a solidarity economy literally puts people and planet before profit it actually shows that everyone can meet their needs in a way without destroying the environment and embodies social, racial, and economic justice and has as its core diversity, cooperation, self-management, and genuine uh, sustainability. It highlights alternatives to capitalism and articulate approaches to our economy to show how we can actually engage in the buying and selling of goods and services, how we can do economics without destroying the planet. That is the essence of a solidarity economy. So it does actually, I think, invite us to ask, uh, well, uh, and, and to be really straightforward, to talk about the current economic system in which we are living is called capitalism. And I often come across folks who will immediately try to defend capitalism without actually understanding the core definitions. So, and secondly, they will then say, well, I'm a capitalist and begin to, def to defend the system. Now, to be clear, one can defend the principles of capitalism and defend the idea, but unless you actually own the means of production or unless you're actually living on your financial investments and do not have to work uh, for wages, you are not by definition a capitalist. You can defend capitalism, you can support capitalism, but these words have meaning and they're important. So the, the, this definition literally comes out of, like go to Webster's Dictionary, go to any introduction to macroeconomics uh, at any college level class. Heck, go to a high school economics teacher and everyone will basically agree that these are the core characteristics. And I'm gonna run by them 
because I think it's important to understand that what we're describing is a interconnected, inherently consistent way of how to manage the household known as uh, the, 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 either the United States of America or at this point, the world economy. Number one, the private ownership of the means of production. That is as opposed to the public ownership or the public management, but that those decisions are privately held. And that means not just the factories, but the ranches and the farms and all of the ways that you produce goods and services are privately owned. Number two, closely related, that goods and services are produced as commodities. This is important because commodity production literally means that you produce goods for sale at a profit rather than for immediate need and allocation of immediate needs. That ties us to number three, which is that goods and services are produced for profit, also known as profit maximization. And this inherent logic of profit maximization, again, undergirds, all, like all of these are interconnected principles. The fourth concept or characteristic of capitalism is wage labor that labor itself is also a commodity that's bought and paid for, uh, and that it is also a commodity that's, lastly, the, the market allocation or market exchange, that all of these goods and services are, are, uh, are both produced uh, and, and distributed uh, through a market economy. Taken together, these characteristics uh, are why I will assert that capitalism is the ideology of the cancer cell, because it literally expects unlimited growth on a finite planet. Whether we think that capitalism has so far served us well or not, I will simply assert that as I see it, these five characteristics are literally going to destroy the planet that we depend upon for life itself if we do not change to a version of a solidarity economy. Do you want me to hop in here? I want you to do the system change piece. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just uh, quickly run through this just in case you're wondering, okay, what is, so that's a sort of a definition of capitalism. Here are the five key characteristics. Um, but then what can be confusing is that there are different models of capitalism. And so here's a kind of a, a really sky high breakdown of capitalism versus post capitalism. Um, so let's look at the, the right hand side, the capitalist side first and just note that the that the dominant paradigm now is neoliberalism, which is pretty conservative fairly cutthroat version of capitalism, as opposed to New Deal capitalism. So coming out of world, after, what emerged after the Great Depression and lasted through the late 70s was New Deal capitalism, where there was a, a strong, stronger commitment to the social safety net, stronger acceptance of the role of government to regulate the economy and stabilize it. And then the other one is social democracy. So you can think of that as even a stronger version of New Deal capitalism, um, say, think of Scandinavia. Okay, so really strong social safety net, uh, strong government um, intervention. And then we'll be talking more about solidarity economy and post-capitalist models. So the only thing I'll mention here is that solidarity economy is a big tent. We embrace democratic, um, democratic post-capitalist um, models. We do not embrace authoritarian post-capitalist models. So like the former Soviet unions, Union, um, uh, you know, to some extent, so China, North Korea, right? So those authoritarian states would clearly not be an example of what solidarity economy embraces. So that's a really sky high overview. Just wanted to do a quick uh, uh, look at the different models within both these broad cap capitalist and post capitalist, um, I don't know, the taxonomies. All right.
Back to you, David. Well, thank you, Emily. And folks, uh, and I'll ask Nick to make sure to drop into the chat a really phenomenal uh, uh, essay co-authored by Emily Kawano and our colleague, Julie Matai, uh, that appeared in Nonprofit Quarterly that literally does a, uh, a deeper dive and survey into uh, the, the notion between post-capitalist and capitalist, uh, the different types of solidarity economy. I believe it's titled On Isms uh, to help people actually understand and think through those various like neoliberalism and socialism and capitalism and uh, fascism and et cetera. I mean, these are really important concepts. Um, the next thing that I am tasked with doing, and really the last one, is if we've got a definition of capitalism, which literally is, again, a definition that economists from Milton Friedman to Karl Marx would basically agree, like that's what we're talking about when we mean capitalism. There is an emerging new economic paradigm. It's not just new people, do it, people doing things differently. There is an entire theoretical construct that is emerging that is called the solidarity economy. And at the US Solidarity Economy Network, here are the principles and values that we use to describe the characteristics. And I'm gonna just hit these one at a time briefly because it really stands in stark contrast to what makes the US Solidarity Economy Network unique. And that is to cut to the chase, we do not believe it is possible to reform capitalism, uh, that there are many steps to, uh, and different ways to do it. But if you reform capitalism sufficiently to meet these principles, we would argue you have a new system. Uh, and it's not called capitalism anymore, it would be called something else. So those five principles, number one, a concept of pluralism, which is to say that there are many different approaches. We are not dogmatic, we are not rigid. We recognize that there are many paths up the mountain. Uh, there are any number of different ways to describe it, but that the solidarity economy is not a fixed blueprint. We acknowledge that there are multiple ways to achieve the goal of economic, racial justice, and ecological sustainability. Another principle, and again, these are like capitalism and interconnected, inherently uh, consistent worldview. And that is the concept of solidarity. Uh, the notion that our interactions should be grounded in cooperation, sharing, altruism, love, caring, and gifting. And I wanna say how refreshing it is to me to be able to be with other Solidarity Economy Network practitioners to actually talk about hard economics uh, and talk about love and compassion in the same sentence. It really is, not for me, inspiring and it makes me uh, that that vision uh, of talking about love is part of the thing that I think that we need more of in both politics and economics. Third, a concept of equity and that is to oppose all forms of oppression or the intersecting nodes. We sometimes say equity across all dimensions of race and gender, sexual orientation, uh, ethnicity, uh, et cetera. And notice the difference between, we say equity, not equality, because what we understand is in a current white supremacist, patriarchal, settler colonial system, that there are some of us who have been incredibly privileged and others who have been uh, systematically exploited and oppressed. And we're simply not starting from the same starting point. So if we want equity, we can't treat everybody equally from jump, we have to make sure that we are paying attention to redress past systemic uh, uh, oppressions and transgressions. Fourth is the concept of sustainability. We recognize and acknowledge that we're drawing upon indigenous perspectives of living in proper relationship or right relationship with mother earth and each other. A quick note, uh, to my colleague and mentor, Chris Peters of the Seventh Generation Fund for Indigenous Development, who reminds me and every white crowd uh, that I've ever seen him speak to is just a reminder that every human being descends from indigenous peoples. All of us have as a birthright that level of interconnectedness and living in harmony. 
And it wasn't until settler colonialism and imperialism pushed peoples out of and off of their ancestral lands. But we all have a right to sustainability. And last, the principle of participatory democracy. Uh, remember that the word democracy also comes from Greek. It means demos, uh, the people, and kratia, power or rule. And so literally, democracy just means that the people have the power to govern themselves or to rule. And so we believe in underscoring participatory democracy. That is, in a nutshell, any decision that affects your life, including economic ones, you ought to have an opportunity to help to shape that decision. Doesn't mean you get your way, doesn't mean that you get to win, but it means in a participatory process, you get to participate and helping to shape that decision. And those connected together make up the, the solidarity economy. And with that, I will invite uh, Emily, any sort of uh, wrap up that you need, uh, and then to segue us into how do we concretely move in that direction? Um, yeah, so I guess I would just make the connect between the principles and the practices. So there is a way in which solidarity economy is looking, is, is almost a theory in search of practice, right? It's a framework that's grounded in these values. And we're looking out at the world and saying, what are the practices that that align with these values that we would embrace as being part of solidarity economy, that if we put them all together, we have at least a foundation of this other world that we're trying to build. Um, so that's sort of wrapping up. I guess we can move on to talk a little bit about the, this candidate survey. Um, we could go, yeah, we could go to the next one. So, all right, so just a little bit of background. Um, we worked on a, a candidate survey thinking like this grew out of the presidential, um, the presidential campaigns and just noting that even among very progressive and uh, socialist candidate like Bernie Sanders, there was still no mention of anything that we would be embracing um, as particularly alternative. So solidarity economy would absolutely endorse a lot of the of a progressive agenda, but in terms of actually building non capitalist um, Practices, there wasn't a mention of cooperatives. There wasn't a mention of community land trust or wasn't a mention of public banking. There was right. So none of that. And so we were thinking, well, what if we developed a candidate survey just to try to put it on the, the agenda or just a mention of it in either the national on the national level or even like percolating down into more local um, candidate ra races. Um, just starting to get it into the 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 dialogue, um, the discussion. And so we looked at these five different areas um, that that seem urgent and seem to be in crisis and um, how solidarity economy offers at least some potential partial um, ways forward. So the first area was around jobs. Um, so clearly, um, and this is no longer true, this was written before uh, the pandemic. So obviously uh, unemployment rate is not low anymore, but even when it was, um, it obscures the fact that the real unemployment rate was much, much higher. A lot of people have just given up searching for jobs at all. They're so discouraged, so they're not even counted. Um, and then a lot of people are having to hold multiple jobs because they aren't working in, their, their wage isn't high enough where they can just have one job and make ends meet. Um, okay, so that's the problem with jobs. And we, so if you wanna go, so we want to lift up uh, worker-owned cooperatives as part of the solution. Um, so instead of when you think about those five characteristics of capitalism, where you have the capitalists who own the means of production, right? They, the capitalist owns the business, the capitalist gets, gets the profits and controls the profits and has that decision-making power while the workers do the work, right? Um, that, that inherently 
eat, no matter how kind the owner capitalist might be, nonetheless, there's still this tension, right, between the owners and the workers. So a worker cooperative uh, kind of solves that class conflict by making the owners also uh, the workers. So it's democratic. Um, you know, statistics show that in general, on average, worker-owned cooperatives outperform conventional capitalist businesses in terms of their survival rates, in terms of their wages and benefits, in terms of their promotional opportunities. Um, they even, interestingly enough, boost civic engagement because workers engage in decision-making uh, processes in the workplace, and it tends to spill over out into their, their own lives and communities. Um, and it's really worker cooperatives are really experiencing an upward trend. Uh, there are many cities that are investing in cooperatives. There are foundations that are really turning to, to cooperatives as part of a more equitable economic development strategy. Um, and you can see that last bullet point. There was a recent uh, one foundation uh, channeled $32 million uh, to four co-op developers. So it just gives you a sense of this upward momentum. Okay, let's move on. Thank you. I'm going to pause for one sure. second, Sorry. Emily, and just see if we have any questions. If people would like, they can post questions in the Q&A, or if you are familiar with raise, the raised hand feature, you can also do that, and I can unmute you to ask your question. So I'll just take one second, and while people are thinking about that, Emily, I will bring up, I know, um, one of the issues I've heard about co-ops is also the equity issue of who are, or who are the main participants in some of those co-ops. It's predominantly, you know, uh, you know, especially like with the marijuana industry, it ended up being predominantly white, you know, um, if there are cooperatives, it's typically white ownership, white um, dominated sectors. Um, so getting back to that equity component in the five principles of the solidarity economy, I think that's one important thing to keep in mind. Did you have anything you want to say to that? And then we have a hand up here. I'm going to unmute. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, co-ops, worker co-ops in particular, have gone up and down in history. Right now, they're, ha they're experiencing this upsurge. Uh, tends to happen in, in kind of trying times. Mm -hmm. um, and this wave of cooperative development is really, and I think it's partly also due to the push from solidarity economy, as well as other social movements, mm -hmm. to really center um, equity. And so um, the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives, the National Federation, is very much focused on um, BIPOC uh, cooperative development. Mm -hmm. um, the largest worker cooperative in the country with over 2,000 workers is the um, Cooperative Home Care in the Bronx. So majority women of color and immigrant women, most of whom used to be on some form of transfer payment. Um, one of the fastest growing um, sectors of worker co-ops are immigrant-owned uh, um, house cleaning cooperatives, and mm -hmm. it's a way that people who are undocumented can start their own businesses and not have to worry about filing all that paperwork you need to do to prove that you're, you're here illegally. So there's a huge upsurge of cooperatives in communities of color that are being led. So my, the, one, the cooperative development um, organization, Wellspring, that I'm the co-director of, mm -hmm. we very consciously located in the city. Um, we focus on underserved communities mm -hmm. and hire from those communities. So absolutely majority people of color, people who are un or underemployed. So acutely aware of that. And I think it is a, yeah. a kind of a dialogue between solidarity economy and the cooperative movement, right? Really pushing on this equity. If you don't center equity, which solidarity economy always does, if you don't center it, the default will be that uh, these, these alternatives tend to thrive in more white, more affluent, more, you know, uh, well-educated communities. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, so yeah, we have a handful of questions here. So I'm gonna let uh, Laura 
go ahead and ask your question. Laura, you're unmuted if you want to go ahead and talk. Okay. Uh, yeah, I really love the way this um, information is organized and the PowerPoints and I'm taking all sorts of notes and I'd probably, you know, love to get it, get the mm -hmm. PowerPoint later. Um, and I learn a lot from examples and I don't know that this might be too big a question to deal with during this uh, webinar, but um, what countries do you think are the closest to achieving, um, you know, moving toward a solidarity economy and, um, and, and sort of what's missing in those countries. I mean, I learn a lot from examples, you know, and inspired by um, places that are actually trying. And I'm curious about where you would put in the system change scenario of capitalist and post-capitalist um, countries like Cuba and Venezuela and the Scan Scandinavian countries and things like that. Like what country or area of a country uh, do you think it comes the closest? And of course, there's um, the um, Mondragon in uh, Spain. But so that's my question. Examples. Right. Thank you, Laura. Um, all right. And are you wanting to take these one by one and, or are you taking a block? Why don't, of why don't we go ahead and respond to that and then I'll see if I can kind of combine some questions here going forward. So go ahead and respond if you could. Uh, okay, I'll take a quick uh, crack at that, David, if you want to add. Uh, so the in easy is um, Mondragon is clearly a model that, um, so first of all, I have to say solidarity economy is a big tent. So I'm going to really answer uh, uh, for myself, and I will note if it's kind of uh, a pretty commonly held view, but there will always be people who don't even agree with me, right? Um, but Mondragon is, in general, something that we would absolutely embrace and, and say this is uh, a very promising and inspiring model. There are a lot of critiques to be made as well. We understand they're operating in the context of capitalism and trying to deal with compromises that you have to make, given that you're operating in capitalism. But just as, a, as an example, for, for anybody that doesn't know Mondragon, it's a, a region in the Basque region of Spain that has probably the, it has the largest worker cooperative um, ecosystem in the world, right? So some hundred worker owned um, cooperatives, they have uh, manufacturing, they have a university, their own social security, housing, research and development. So it's really this integrated system of cooperatives, very, very, very successful, both in Spain as well as on a global level. Um, but yeah, they've made compromises because they still are, are having to try to survive in a capitalist uh, world. Um, as to, to countries, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that there's any country that we would say absolutely this is solidarity economy, right? There are, there's lots of things that we would embrace about different countries. Absolutely many things that uh, we would admire about Venezuela and Cuba. Um, you know, the dem democracy aspect is very important. So there's, there's criticisms to be made there. Scandinavia, we would say right now is capitalist. Some people in Scandinavia see, the, see where they are now as a stepping stone towards going to, to full on socialism, democratic socialism. But mm -hmm. some people aren't, you know, say, no, we're happy with what, what we have, which is a more, much more humane version of, of capitalism. And so from a solidarity economy perspective, we, we don't believe that we can really survive capitalism and we need to go beyond. Absolutely. Okay, thank you, Emily. We have um, a few questions in the chat, and I think I'll address those to David. But quickly before we jump to that, um, I'm having a little technical difficulty opening the Q&A. So I know that there might be a question or two in there. If you could post that in the chat, for some reason the Q&A is not opening. So I will monitor the chat for any questions. But um, right now I'm, I'm having trouble getting the Q&A to open. Um, so please just post your question in there. So David, um, we had a few questions in our chat. Um, if you wanna go ahead and try to address some of those related to um, basically how do cities do this, um, related to land and ownership issues, um, 
what are the next so go ahead and take that on thank you nick uh, and yep. Uh, thank you for your question, Laura, and I think I agree with everything that Emily uh, has just shared. And if you look at the on-isms piece, I think you'll begin to see pretty easily and quickly, uh, you know, that the Scandinavian countries are in fact social democracies operating under that capitalist system. Like, uh, but, but what we are witnessing is a faster evolution, I think, and, and a devolution, like the, to, to put a fine point on it. Uh, the neoliberal agenda and the neoliberal experiment is failing. Uh, I believe that we are living in a interstitial conjuncture moment. Uh, we are, we are like this current system is going to evolve and it'll either be in the direction of some version of eco-socialism, some version of solidarity economics, or it's going to become authoritarian. Uh, there's just like, uh, I, I don't think it's possible to, to get around that. I do want to address Amy's uh, series of questions, and thank you for them. Emily, uh, Amy asked, are these co-ops on public land? How does the city bring in a co-op on private land? How does the city do it? And then are there incentives? So Amy, I think uh, I want to clarify. We'll talk about community land trust, which is about physical land, but everything that uh, Emily has described in our support are for worker-owned cooperative businesses. Right. This this is is literally about businesses, uh, and uh, that that uh, worker-owned co-ops are like businesses. They are literally producing goods and services uh, to to be used and and currently to be uh, uh, purchased because it is a way to do it. Like it, it, it is creating the new system within the shell of the old. Right. Like. Uh, ideally, we want to get to a place where goods and services are being produced just for immediate need, and we're not using the characteristics of capitalism, but we, this is the system that we're in. We're trying to evolve it. The last thing that I want to say about worker co-ops, and that is I, five years ago, certainly 10 years ago, uh, was not active in the cooperative movement. I was not against the cooperative movement. But I always felt like, and honestly, Nick, I was like, boy, these are white folks and they're all very like comfortable. And it felt like they were like creating a little bubble of, well, we're just going to have our business operate. We're in a way that I feel good about it and I can have a good living, but it wasn't really connected to the transformational change. And I said, I'm a serious revolutionary. I'm trying to restructure society. Like, I'm not against what you're doing over there, but I'm playing for bigger things. But the reality is that people like Emily and like Kali Akuno from Cooperation Jackson and like many of my colleagues who I'd worked with, I began to see a new awakening of using co-ops, not just in and of themselves. They weren't the end all. They were a strategic way to begin to shift the entire economic framework and now I am part of a worker owned co-op. I'm helping to incubate other cooperators, cooperators because I recognize that these are a tool that we need to use to transition. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for the explanation. Um, I think if we're ready, we can move on to the other components and um, we can have a deeper discussion as we go. Thank you all for the good questions. Keep them coming. Okay, and our next piece. Yeah, so then the next uh, question on, the, on this candidate survey thing is on housing. Clearly, the, there's a, a scarcity uh, of, of affordable housing in this country um, and that it's treated like a, um, it's uh, like a poker chip or a poker game or some, you know, something to gamble on, right? You invest in housing and then you flip it for, for money, for profit. Um, and so we're interested in taking housing um, out of the speculative market as something you play around with to make money, um, that housing should be a right. So, um, and also, right, housing has the capacity to bring down 
the economy, right? 2008 was all about speculation on housing and real estate, and it collapsed the world economy. Um, and like unfettered, unregulated, um, speculative bubbles that emerge out of housing, out of speculation is, can be <laughs> incredibly devastating. Um, a lot of people, particularly um, people of color, lost a huge amount of wealth um, when the housing market collapsed. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. We would, uh, solidarity economy, oh, hmm. can you go, right. So uh, one way forward on this is thinking about community land trusts. So if you aren't familiar with a community land trust, think about it as, so for, first of all, a way to decommodify land and housing, right? Taking it out of the speculative market, um, uh, creating permanently affordable housing. And the way that it does this is the land trust would own the land. Um, and then w there are different models, but say the, they leverage grants and, and other put together other financing packages to be able to develop lower cost housing. So somebody buys a, a piece of a, a house, say, for a pretty reasonable affordable rate. In exchange, right, they agree, right, that, that when, when they go to sell it, there's a formula where they can recoup whatever they've invested. So if they've done some improvements or built on an addition, they can recoup that. And they can also um, capture some of the equity gain if real estate values have gone up. But if real estate values have doubled, they can't do that, right? So that's part of the exchange in getting something affordable in the first place. So it maintains that affordability on a permanent basis. Um, so a lot, so there's models where people buy the housing. There are also community land trust affordable housing models where there are rentals. Um, and in general, because these community land trusts also offer various kinds of support, the foreclosure rates are far, far lower than in conventional housing. So this is, this was through the 2008 meltdown um, and there's, this, there's an element of community control um, over the CLT. Um, and so the land and the housing is uh, permanently put in, um, in the hands of the community to provide affordable housing. Sometimes there are other things like uh, workforce development or job development or co-op development that's added in as well. Oh, and sometimes it's used for um, agriculture, like small developing small farms. So there's lots of, of uses for community land trusts, but we see it as part of the solution to affordable housing. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate this component, especially living in the Bay Area where housing costs are so high. And, you know, I mean, but, but recently there was a study that came out that, you know, we have more vacant housing and this was came up with, with the Moms for Housing in Oakland issue, that we have more vacant housing in the Bay Area than we have homeless people. So it is this commodification component and these large you know, hedge funds are buying up a lot of the, the housing stock and refusing to you know, rent it or sell it until they get the price they want for it. Um, and it's really created a huge problem. So, on the developer side, we hear, oh, we just need to keep building, you know, when that's not necessarily the case. We have the housing here in the Bay Area, but we've got a lot of vacant houses and we've got a lot of houses, these massive houses that are maybe have one or two people living in them. You know, and there's a number of reasons for that, but we won't get into all that today. But I really appreciate the idea of decommodifying housing just like I think we need to decommodify many components of our economy, um, you know, from healthcare and education to housing, all of these things, it should be rights. So, um, and Emily, I, I don't know if you, if you've seen it, but Jeffrey, uh, Levine or Levin, uh, actually asked in the chat, mm -hmm. uh, he said, I live in San Jose where housing speculation is a big problem. We have approximately 8,000 homeless and approximately 24,000 unoccupied housing stock due to speculation. 
How exactly do we mitigate this? Are there examples where this issue has been addressed? So it literally ties into Nick's uh, point. And I will say, uh, and I will invite Emily uh, to also address this, but I really want to underscore Jeffrey, like that's the beauty of using this candidate questionnaire. It, like you can literally take this to anyone running for city council or county board of supervisor. And we have this template to actually ask a very concrete question. Will you support the creation of community land trust to address this chronic problem? And at the end of the day, uh, we are, I don't believe we can actually solve the unhoused problem unless we address the fact that housing now is a commodity and literally like it, it, it is a, it's a, it's the proverbial Gordian knot. It feels like a tangled mess. There's no solution. And of course, if you know that story, uh, you know the answer. You know how you untie the Gordian knot? You cut it. You literally cut it in two. And Melanie, we will post the, the template uh, uh, into, the, into the chat. But I want to invite Emily to share a couple of examples where CLTs or housing cooperatives have actually been used successfully. Yes. Yeah. So let's see. One, one example that's incredibly inspiring is the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative DSNI. Um, it's in Boston. Um, so there's books, there's a film that's been a documentary that's been made, so you could look it up. Um, it's, a, it's a case where a, a very, um, a struggling, uh, pretty poor community in Boston um, organized around, there was arson for profit as well as just, you know, garbage wasn't getting picked up and they organized and they eventually were given um, eminent domain over a few blocks in their neighborhood. They turned it into a community land trust and developed, I mean, a whole lot of things, right? But if you walk in this neighborhood, it looks complete, it just feels different. It feels like a different world. Like the, I swear the air feels different, right? Like it's beautiful. The housing that they've developed that's very affordable is, is gorgeous. It doesn't look like a public housing um, project, right? It's beautiful. Um, there's, there are parks, there's a huge community garden. There's a greenhouse right in the middle of it. The play, the playgrounds are just like the designs are gorgeous. Um, it's still like the demographics are the same, like people were not displaced to do this. Um, and it's, it's community controlled. Um, and the residents have a seat at the table because they own this piece of land. So whenever there's any discussion about how to do economic development in their community, they're always at the table and they have, they have power and control. Um, so that, that's one of the best examples. Um, the stars aligned in a particular way, um, given the, you know, politicians and city council and the mayor. But it just goes to show it's not impossible. So the other place where um, land trusts, community land trusts are super strong is in Burlington. So they have a huge, um, a huge amount of community land trusts that um, are both uh, housing, uh, houses, as well as rentals. Um, yeah, which is why I was always sad that Bernie never mentioned it, right? He's got to know CLTs really well. Never, ever uh, uh, did I uh, hear him mention community land trusts. So there are, there's a national, there's a national network that, so community land trusts are all over the country. Um, sure, I, I know there's ones in California for sure. Um, so how to, how to advance it is, some of it is just, public education, getting people aware that this is a model. Um, there's lots and lots of um, support, like technical assistance. Here's how to. Uh, there's, there's lots of resources available. Um, some of it is policy work. Some is who's going to actually do the heavy lift of developing these things. Um, but there's a lot of, a lot of uh, resources available and a lot of great examples. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one thing before we move on from this, um, Amy was asking about the incentives for landowners um, to, to turn their land into a trust, into a community land trust. Are there any kind of incentives or what are those incentives? 
Um, and then she was also asking, can, uh, can cities and public land be turned into a trust as well? I think that was it. Yeah. So on the second, for sure, right? Like yeah. if the city wanted to hand over some or sell the community land trust land, right? Or vacant buildings to be fixed up or rehabbed or, or uh, 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 demolished and rebuilt on that land, they certainly could, right? That, so that's a, local, that's a local organizing kind of campaign. What are the incentives again, right? On a case by case basis, it all depends on what, what the state, what the tax uh, incentives might be. It's more of a local thing. I hmm. don't know of federal, uh, I, I don't know, there might be. I'm a, yeah, I'll jump in because I love that question because it's like, how can we actually use the levers of government to actually do policies hmm. that incentivize the right thing? And this is really important to underscore that in the Solidarity Economy Network, we are challenging the fact that developers and the wealthy literally are running most city governments, uh, mm -hmm. either in fact or like just one step removed. So imagine for a moment uh, that we and people who think like us in the California Progressive Alliance uh, take over uh, a city government like Richmond, California, for example. And literally what you saw was people's lives begin to get immediately better under uh, that electoral regime. Now imagine that there was an entire economic framework uh, of community land trust and worker-owned cooperatives and public banking and participatory budgeting uh, uh, that, that, that was ready-made and ready to be rolled out by that administration. Uh, frankly, many of us in the Solidarity Economy Network are trying to catch up uh, to the opportunity that Richmond presented. We weren't ready, quite frankly, uh, to provide the kind of off-the-shelf legislation, but we, we are getting there. And to answer your specific question, you could easily say under existing law, we are going to tax community land trusts either at a completely lower rate or even we will waive the property taxes associated with it because we want to incentivize providing housing for the unhoused. Uh, there is, the, like, that's just one specific example of a, a way to incentivize the use of policies that actually would allow uh, these recommendations to actually flourish. It's all about what we are incentivizing or disincentivizing mm -hmm. using government policy. Yeah, definitely could be through taxes or tax rebates or different things. And sometimes cities and counties have dilapidated properties that they want to get rid of and that can also be an avenue for creating some type of community land trust as well. So why don't uh, we continue on and um, go into our next piece? Um, is this Emily? Sure. So yes, climate change is a huge problem. I'm not going to go into the details very much. I mean, uh, uh, let's go on to at least one little piece of the solution. Okay. Um, yeah, so thinking about energy democracy and how can we have collectively or community owned energy systems. Um, so f there's lots of different models. Uh, thinking about community owned solar or um, community owned wind. Um, so locally owned and controlled. Um, yeah, lots of different models. Um, there are um, some good examples that exist. I know in my neck of the woods, um, we have an outfit called Co-op Power that's working on community control, developing community controlled energy. Um, but that's a, it's a general sort of strategy of, of addressing climate change uh, through democratically owned and controlled energy generation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Okay. So this one's David's. David. Or, uh, uh, and Nick. Yes, uh, in fact, uh, Nick, uh, because uh, for folks who don't know, Nick and I both serve on basically the executive <laughs> branch of, <laughs> that's uh, Governor <laughs> Peanut Butter. <laughs> Uh, it, it Nick, take it, take it over since you're working with the so, 
Public Banking Alliance. Yeah, so do what David was going to say, the California Public Banking Alliance, which we created, um, I think, three years ago now, um, with a group of wonderful activists from around the state. We uh, managed to pass the AB 857 to create local public banks, but getting into the, the first with the problem being that our only real source for finance, for financing, for capital, for any kind of projects we want to work on is through um, privately owned banks. And we all know how they operate and um, they extract an enormous amount of profit from our communities that if we had a different source of financing, we could keep that wealth in our community. Because right now we're losing out on an enormous amount of money from our communities that's leaving and going to Wall Street banks. So I don't know if you want to add anything before I go on to our solutions here, David. But um, one of the big solutions, of course, is a public banking system, okay? And this could have multiple levels from the state level, county public banks, regional public banks, city-owned public banks. But the idea being that that community wealth will not be extracted from your community and you democratically govern those banks and determine where those profits would end up. You know, what projects are important to you in, in rebuilding your schools or taking care of your streets or, or green renewable energy projects. So um, public banking is, and is a, a, a very important component to a solidarity economy. We need to have a banking system that's democratically governed that helps to keep our community's wealth in our community, you know, and um, public banks is one of those components to that solution. Um, here in California, we have another bill that has been introduced recently. It is AB 310. That is to create a state public bank. So um, with all that's been going on with COVID, it has been challenging to get local governments to move towards creating local public banks. So we found that it would be fastest or easiest to move from the state level down to the local levels. So we are working towards passing this bill this year and we would love everyone's support on AB 310 so we can convert our infrastructure, our state infrastructure bank into a more traditional um, North Dakota style public bank. Um, and David, you have more to add to that? Unmute. Thank you, yes. Uh, so in a nutshell, uh, I just really wanna underscore something folks. In one legislative session, the California Public Banking Alliance was able to introduce legislation that would allow the creation of local and regional public banks. In one session, we got it through the state Senate, the state assembly, and Governor Newsom signed it. Nobody, including myself, actually thought that we were gonna get it done in, the, in, in one session. It really was uh, a victory that was rather stunning uh, in its implications because it begins to democratize finance itself. We were working very closely with the California Department of Business Organization to promulgate the rules for how public banks would be created and capitalized. And as a lawyer, I can tell you, there are rules and then there are rules, right? Like you can create rules that make it almost impossible to do something. You can make rules that make it super easy to do something. And as far as we could tell, the Department of Business Organization was playing it straight down the middle. Public banks were not going to be given a pass nor were they going to be more difficult than private banks. They were literally uh, 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 basically going to be uh, creating a, a process by which local and regional public banks could be created. They were going to be just as hard, but no harder than the creation of typical private, pub, uh, private banks. Then COVID hit. We became very, it became very clear to us that uh, there was no way to capitalize them. So we have already turned on a dime. We have legislation offered in California now, AB 310. I will drop this into uh, ab310.org. It'll give you everything you need. We are, it's in, in session now. Uh, we are going to try to get this passed through. And if, 
the California Progressive Alliance and your local alliances and your central committees of either the Green Party or the Democratic Party or, or the Peace and Freedom uh, want to endorse it or if organized labor wants to endorse it, we are in a fast track to make uh, lightning strike twice. Yeah. Yeah, and we know that Wall Street banks have woken up to us and are gonna be coming even harder than before. So it will take a lot of work on our side. So um, definitely we can talk more about that for those that are interested, but AB310 is our next step towards getting a state public bank and then local public banks to support our community land trusts and all these other components that, that we want to move towards a solidarity economy. So next we have governance. Yeah, so in this, this area, I'm sure lots of you probably can relate to this. You know, how do local budgets get made? Who decides? What's the process? Do you have any voice in it? It's, it tends to be complicated and um, while we elect our political representatives who make up who who deal with the budget right generally you don't have a direct voice so one of the solidarity economy um, strategies uh, to to make it more of a democratic process you want to go to the next one uh -huh. is um, called participatory budgeting um, so this really the experiments with participatory budgeting really started in um, in Brazil but now it's it's spread all throughout the country including lots of uh, lots of um, experiments in the United States so it ensures that people, particularly on a municipal, mostly on a municipal level, um, it ensures that people have a chance to uh, uh, have a voice in how at least some of the budget, the city budget, the discretionary, discretionary part of the budget is used. And it's not just like you're going to a, uh, a, a city meeting and, and standing up and saying, I want more playgrounds. It's a whole process where communities are, go through training about how our budget's made, what are the, uh, what are the allocations, here's, the set, here's how much you have to control, here's the process. So there's all this training and, and engagement and then people will submit uh, proposals for what to do with the budget. And then there's a whole process for, for ranking and choosing and discuss, discussing and, and hashing it through. Um, so it's been really, really, um, successful, um, not only in, in getting, uh, meeting the needs, especially of some of the poor communities that normally are really excluded from the process, but also just getting people directly engaged in democratic uh, decision making. So it's very, it's a wonderful way just to engage people. Um, so I'll stop there. Yeah, and, and I know with, with all of the recent actions around defunding police, participatory budgeting would have been an enormous, um, enormously helpful tool, um, seeing as many of our large cities spend over a third of their budget on the police, whereas with more of a participatory budget process, that would likely not happen. Um, so, all right, if I don't see any questions up right now. I'm going to go on to our last and before you do, uh, Nick, I, I really want to underscore that this notion of participatory budgeting, uh, Emily uh, uh, said it, but I, I think it's so outside of our typical framework that I, I, I guess I want to repeat it and just use it, say it in my own words. Because I want you to imagine for a moment that, uh, uh, that we know that elected officials are constantly bombarded with, oh, but I have competing interests. And, I have to decide how it works. And we've been trained uh, in this country to think, well, that's what democracy is. We, we, we vote for people and then we empower them to quote, represent us. Mm -hmm. And I often think that, you know, that's a bit like uh, seeing a book that says how to get rich. And you think, boy, I'd like to get rich. 
and you buy the book and the whole point of the book is, well, here are the ways that you can uh, lobby me, a person of great wealth, to decide if I want to give you any money or what you have to do to get some of my money, right? Like, uh, what if instead it, the participatory budgeting says, well, we're literally going to empower the people who reside in the place to actually uh, make the decision, but also to task them with the responsibility of recognizing you can't have all of the things. The reality is our budget is a finite amount. And Emily has made a compelling case for clinics. And Nick has made a compelling case for more libraries. And Laura has made a compelling case for improving uh, the roads. And Nassim reminded the group that, oh my God, our water uh, treatment plant uh, needs work. So you create a, a large public participatory process where the community has to come together to grapple with what are our priorities? How much can we, like, we can't spend all the money on all of the things, but it empowers people and gives them the responsibility for making the kind of decisions that we've been trained to think that we delegate to our elected representatives. It really is a paradigm shifting way to think about how our economy works, how our budget works, what governance really is. Absolutely. Sorry, I just, I, again, to me, this participatory budgeting, uh, I, I, it, 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 to me is one, uh, like I love all of these policies, but this one really does change how I think about government, right? It is a, it, it is a, it is a transformational uh, paradigm. Absolutely. Yes. And I will open it up for any questions at this point. Um, if you would like, you can raise your hands, the virtual hands, um, and I can unmute you. Um, or I can also, um, you can post your questions in the, uh, in the chat as well. But um, I would I'm, also say, yeah, uh, to go back, there was a question about a particular example around um, uh, energy, about uh, a question about the Marin Clean Energy. Marin, and then something San Jose Clean Energy. Yeah, San Jose Community Choice Energy. Um, so, what I would say about that is. I don't know that much about Marin County. I wrote back in the chat, like who owns it, right? This is a lot of the question. So there are lots of um, uh, privately owned, in other words, capitalist owned um, companies. And, and some of them do the right thing. And some of them are really invested in, in being green. And some of them are really invested in treating workers well, relatively, you know, mm -hmm. they pay them relatively well, respect workers' rights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not to say that all capitalists are evil, right? Some are really, I would consider them allies. But, but what we're talking about is the long view. Where are we headed in the long term? It's not just like better behaved, capitalist enterprises. It's like, how do we transform the logic of the whole system so that what it puts front and center is people and planet as opposed to a system that's driven by the assumption that, we, that, that the, um, the company needs to always, always, always maximize profit and grow, which is just not sustainable. And so when you're looking at something like Marin County, and again, I don't know who owns it, if it's privately owned, even if they're trying to do the right thing, but the profits are going to the owners, um, it's for, uh, for solidarity economy anyway, it's problematic, right? That's still a capitalist model. Um, and like, so, so you can't just look at whether they're doing a little bit of the right thing here or there, right? You really do have to also look at who owns it. Um, is, it collect is there some kind of collective voice? Um, is it being run for the sake of the, either the capitalist owner or the shareholders, the investors, right? If it's just the investors and they're always trying to get the biggest bang for their investment, problematic for solidarity economy. Yeah. And and I wanted to jump in because I am quite actually, I'm actually quite familiar with the community choice energy programs and Emily is asking the right question. And, and let's be very clear here. 
So the entire community choice energy process basically it had been created as joint power agreements or JPAs in, in California, which basically says, okay, PG&E owns both the energy production and transmission lines. So how instead can we source the energy for the grid in better, greener ways? So mm -hmm. does community choice energy do good? Absolutely, it does good. It, 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 it moves in the direction of more renewables. But Emily's question is pertinent and salient. Who owns it? The PG&E still owns the overall grid, the overall transmission lines, and even the good energy, even if it's being fed into the grid by, uh, by others, it's still, quote, good capitalists who actually are investing because they think that they're going to make profit off of it. That's why for us, the answer, and if you take a look at the candidate questionnaire that we did, it's very concrete around locally owned, democratically operated energy production and transmission. Think of rural electric co-ops, right? That's really what we're talking about, but you could do it at a municipal level. And by the way, for those of us who live uh, in wildfire country, remember that the the, the, the places that were non-PG&E, the places where electric co-ops actually existed, basically did not have service interruptions uh, uh, during the, uh, last year's fire season. It's really worth looking at. The fact is that not only are these, do these things exist, but almost every time you look at them, they're actually better versions of whatever it is that they're doing. They're more effective. Uh, they, they, are, they, they are better ecologically. Like solidarity economy works, y'all. That's the, that's the mm -hmm. secret. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and it does work. And it can happen at the local level. I think that's a thing to bring it back to, too. It's, it's not all going to happen at once, but we can start creating more local co-ops I know in our area, we have some local pizza places that have converted to co-ops. Um, it's a start, you know, creating more cooperatives. We can. So I got to stop you, Nick. In that case, like anybody who lives in San Jose, stop going to corporate pizza places and go eat pizza at the, at the, at the pizza co-op. Like yep. that's the thinking that we have to get into. We have to live into this solidarity economy. Yes. Like, do not go to corporate pizzeria. You need to live it. And that's, that's a great example and a great point that we need to support these local cooperatives. So you should know, make yourself aware of what cooperatives do I have in my area? How can I support them? Is there any way I can help to create new cooperatives? And, um, you know, and, and can, I, can I encourage more community land trusts? Is there a local group working in my area on community land trusts? Um, you know, is, is there someone working on energy independence? Um, you know, public banking, we've already mentioned AB 310. There's, there's many, many actions people can get involved with and this is happening around you. Um, so make yourself aware of what's happening in the local area, get involved with any or all of these organizations that we've mentioned today um, and we will keep moving this forward together. Um, one quote I wanted to throw out there was from from uh, Greta here saying that, you know, people are suffering, people are dying, entire ecosystems are collapsing. We're at the beginning of a mass extinction and all we're hearing about or all we're talking about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. Capitalism must end for us to survive and sustain on this planet. So a solidarity economy is the next phase. So we've had a wonderful discussion here. I've learned a lot and I've been really appreciative of everything David and Emily has brought. Um, I don't know, see any last questions here. Uh, I do see a hand up here, Amy, I'm gonna unmute you. So you are unmuted, Amy, if you'd like to talk. Um, yeah, hi, thank you uh, for the presentation. Um, so yeah, one of my questions earlier on was about, so we had a forum recently and we asked the question of candidates for a supervisor about would they support a county bank, public bank. Um, and 
they all, they all, well, one of them is a banker, private banker. And he, he basically said that Napa County was too small to have its own public bank and that he would support a regional bank. Um, and then all the other ones just kind of fell in line with that. So I'm just wondering, um, I don't know if you have any information about that. Is it based on the population or the, the amount of the general fund? And is there some kind of threshold for what would make a city or a county a good candidate for a public bank? Thank you so much uh, for, for that question, Amy. And uh, the, the, uh, like, I am not a finance expert, but everybody that I've talked to, including people in the solidarity economy uh, movement, including in the public, bank, uh, public banking mo movement, has basically confirmed that it is true that in order for a bank to, remember, because a public bank is still a bank, and so just like a worker-owned co-op or a business is still a business, the, the model for banking to work and to be to properly capitalize it in order to do it uh, is one that, that you need deposits equivalent, uh, especially for the reasons that we want to use it. It takes about, uh, at, at the bare minimum, about half a billion dollars with a B. So uh, I have sadly come to realize that it is true that Humboldt County can't capitalize a, a county public bank, neither can Napa. In fact, uh, we are in fact, uh, in a best case scenario, we'd be looking at a regional bank, probably from, I'd say Marin up to, uh, you know, uh, Northern California, think of the public bank of the North Coast. Uh, as we like to tell our friends in the San Francisco Bay Area that up here, we're the real Northern California. Like there's still another six hours of California uh, outside of the San Francisco Bay. But the point is, that that number, uh, Amy, uh, does mean that for local or regional public banks, the capitalization question, it looks like half a billion in assets are needed. What that means is all of the major cities, all the major big counties could do it right away because they are in fact operating at those kind of numbers. Uh, but it's also why uh, uh, even, even with that in mind, with the, the, the economic tsunami that's coming as a result of COVID, uh, we don't think it's possible even for San Francisco or, or uh, Silicon Valley likely to be able to capitalize a public bank because we're looking at billions of dollars in deficits at the county uh, and city levels uh, coming up. And it's why we have shifted to for a statewide public bank uh, through AB 310. I hope that was helpful, Amy, because, yes. yeah, okay, good. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it. All right, I do not see any more hands up and I do not see any more questions in our chat. So if there are no more, uh, someone may have posted one in the Q&A again. I'm still having trouble opening that. David, so I'm know. typing in uh, as they, they are coming into the Q&A because I can access it, Nick. Okay. And, I hope folks are finding my responses uh, helpful. And if not, you can drop it into the chat uh, if you have any follow-up. Because again, Emily and I are here uh, because we support the California Progressive Alliance and we want to help, like we've created a tool known as a candidate questionnaire uh, that we want you to use and feel comfortable with. And it's not merely educating on these uh, policy proposals. It's actually to make demands. Like the reality is that these solutions exist, but we have not yet created the political will to demand that they be implemented. That's why the California Progressive Alliance is so critical. It's why our local alliances are so critical. And it's why this candidate questionnaire needs to be taken to city council uh, 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 candidate forums and board of supervisors mm -hmm. and say, you're asking for my vote. You say that you know housing is a problem. I'm going to tell you in three to five sentences what a community land trust is, and I want to know, will you support policies to use the community land trust uh, model? Yes or no? All right. We, uh, we did get a little more question here um, about, I'm not sure if we'll be able to answer all this, but let's see if we can get something. So keeping the 1% ability to influence politicians out of the participatory governance. So an influence of the, the elite and of the wealthy into our democratic process. Are there any strategies to keeping them out? Um, 
So, so really quickly for participatory budgeting, usually it's done on a, um, you know, neighborhood by neighborhood basis. So these are, these would tend to be neighborhoods that, you know, the 1% are usually living off in a different area. So uh, you're, you're probably more talking about on a national level, but on a local municipal level, participatory yeah. uh, budgeting really is a way to give some voice to the communities that are usually voiceless. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Emily. And um, yeah, I think it was more, it seems related to a more national perspective, mm -hmm. like a Citizens United um, corporations are people kind of question. But um, yes, I mean, we, we absolutely do need to change that as well. That's a much larger picture item. But yes, participatory democracy in the more local and neighborhood levels. So um, we did then, schedule it. Go ahead. Well, and then so the follow on thing, I think, uh, someone who commented, so so like, um, Constitution, constitutional amendment to abolish illegitimate da, 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 corporate constitutional rights, money equals free speech. And then somebody said, doesn't this have to happen first before we can do any of these things in a way that makes a real difference? So um, this is me personally. I think that we just can't afford to wait for any magic bullet before we can start moving on any other fronts. Like we need to, to fire on all fronts things are that dire um, mm. and there are some things that would make other things easier but in the meantime i think you still need to argue you still need to be organizing on other fronts and so like the whole um i think in the united states a lot of the organizing of the left the progressive movement for a long time has been operating more on the resist like what don't we like what are we against? How do we stop the harms? Mm -hmm. um, and for a long time, the left has been wringing its hands. We don't have solutions. We don't have solutions. But at the same time, there are many solutions that have been developing over these many, 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 many years. Some of these are very old. Some of them are new. Some of them are alternative. Some of them are mainstream. mainstream. And we need to do both, right? We need to yeah. both resist but we also need to be doing the build. The build needs to be happening now. We can't just wait until we have constitutional amendments or Citizens United or whatever. Yeah. We have to fire on all these fronts. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, I just want to echo that. I absolutely agree. We, we can't wait for a constitutional amendment. And, and I think we have a huge amount of opportunity here in November. I know with a number of races in California for some, some excellent young progressives to get elected at every level of office and you know um i'm i'm hopeful for for a lot of good results out of november and um you know i know at california progressive alliance we have endorsed a number of great candidates you can find out more about them on our website um but i think by getting good people like that elected you know we can do a lot of this stuff at the local level we don't need a constitutional amendment you know to create a community land trust or a cooperative or a public bank, like most of these, we can all do at our local level and, and build that network, you know, and then hopefully expand it to a more national um, level. So Nick, before we move on, and I know we're about to close, but uh, I, as a lawyer, uh, I want folks to, to, to listen to how carefully I parse my language right now, because I will simply tell you that in San Jose, the 10th largest city in the United States of America, uh, the third largest city in California, you have running for city council, Jake Tonkel. Uh, mm -hmm. Jake is on the California uh, uh, Pub Public Banking Alliance. Mm -hmm. uh, Jake has uh, uh, endorsed almost every single one of the solidarity economy uh, proposals that we've put forward here. Now, you know, folks can do what they want with that information, but I am sharing information with you uh, that Jake Tonko running for San Jose City Council uh, is publicly supporting uh, the, the, the core issues that we have been describing that make up a solidarity economy. So do with that information what you will, uh, but that is a factual reporting of Jake Tonko running for City Council 
uh, in San Jose. Yeah, third largest city in the state. So support those type of candidates and you can find out more about him and others at our website. So we have one last person, Nassim has a hand up. I'm gonna unmute you, Nassim, if you'd like to go ahead and speak. Hi, thank you so much for having this discussion. Again, I appreciate the, the vast areas that you've covered. It's seldom that we hear all of the different ways a solidarity peace economy can actually integrate into our daily lives. Uh, you took words right out of my mouth, David. Yes, I am a big supporter of Jake. I live in San Jose, unfortunately not in his district. But when we think about the huge effect, this ripple effect that a local candidate at a city council level can make, it's incredible. Right here in San Jose, currently we have a very divided city council group. We have a six to five vote on really critical votes all the time that we see go against the needs of the people who live in San Jose because of one seat. So when you think about local politics and think, oh, you know, it's not as important. National politics is where corporate free matters. Don't be mistaken. Developers run this city and they run all of our policies because they are the people who put city council members into their seats. So we have some good city council members, but even they are not running corporate free. Even they are not publicizing that as a true representative, of people's voice, you must be corporate free. Why is that? Because that just hasn't been done. So when Jake wins this seat, I think it'll open up the demand and possibility that other good candidates see that they don't have to shy away from stating proudly that they're corporate free and voice their votes for the people. So thank you so much again for this. I just wanted to give that plug. Uh, Jake's website is Jake. 4d6.com. It is the uh, number four D and the number six. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Nassim. Thank you so much. Yeah. And, and again, I, I want to plug one other candidate. We have Alex Lee, who's going to be elected as the youngest uh, state assembly member, the youngest state elected person, I think, in our entire state history. He just turned 25 years old uh, a few days ago and he will be representing the um, eastern part, southeastern part of the San Francisco Bay Area here. Um, and he's another wonderful young progressive. So I think, again, we have a lot of promise come November, um, but we have a lot of work to do on all these fronts. So get involved. If you're interested in getting involved in one of our local alliances or cooperatives, or if you want to get involved with California Progressive Alliance, please reach out to us, check our websites. Um, we need all the help we can get to make all of these wonderful things happen. So again, I want to thank our speakers, David and Emily, you're wonderful. And thank you so much for taking this time this afternoon. And I want to also thank all of our attendees for spending their afternoon with us as well. Um, you know, this is a very valuable discussion and I'm just thankful for everyone to be here. And I hope to uh, our paths cross again here in the near future and, and wish everyone health and, and well-being. So thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye, everybody.